practices with this university, may we also pay respect to the knowledge embedded forever within the Aboriginal custodianship of country. I would also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you're all joining us virtually today in the webinar. We pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Just a couple of housekeeping and reminders for everyone present. This webinar will be recorded. There will be a live Q&A session at the end of the presentation. You can, and Catherine and Catherine will be able to answer all of your questions. For everyone participating in person, please put your hand up and one of my lovely colleagues at the back will come with a mic and you'll be able to ask your question to Catherine and Catherine. Um, just please speak directly into the mic and then that should be okay from there. From everyone, for everyone partic participating virtually, please use the Q&A function on the webinar and, we'll be, and we will ask your, the presenters your questions. In the case of an emergency, please follow staff directions as we go outside. If anyone needs to use the bathrooms, they are located on the back. So please exit from the back doors and they should be on your left hand side. And without further ado, I would like to introduce Professor Catherine Lambie and Dr. Catherine Page Jeffrey. Hi guys. Thank you. Um, so I'm Catherine Lumby. Um, I'm a professor of media and communications at Sydney Uni. We have um, a degree. Um, we have undergraduate and postgraduate degrees in media and communications, um, which I encourage you to look at at some point. Um, so why am I here? Well, I'm 61 years old. So I'm really here as someone from the Stone Age when it comes to social media, right? Um, when I was um, a teenager, we didn't have these, obviously. The telephone, um, I'm going to tell you a horrifying story here. The telephone was a very heavy thing that sat on a hall table and was connected to the wall. And you had to ask your parents if you were going to call someone and everyone could hear every conversation you had. Just digest that for a minute, right? So it was kind of um, that the first thing is we had no interconnectivity. There wasn't an internet, obviously. Um, I, before I became an academic, I was a print and TV journalist. And when I first arrived at the Sydney Morning Herald in 1987, uh, there were people still using typewriters. Computers were only just arriving and there was absolutely no internet. So you couldn't go and Google search anything. We had a paper library, et cetera. And so I think that my function here today is to kind of say, you know, how much has changed? And the other thing, final thing I'll say is Kat and I both share a view that there's a lot of moral panic, which we'll talk about, about um, young people and social media. And we just kind of don't agree with that. And we're very interested in what you've got to say. Thanks, Catherine. So I'm Catherine Page Jeffrey. I'm a lecturer here in media and uh, here at the University of Sydney in media and communications. I'd love to say that uh, my upbringing was entirely different to Catherine's, but I'm not quite as young as perhaps I look. No, is that, is <laughs> yeah, that blowing right. my own horn? I don't know. Um, but I'm a researcher uh, and I look at digital media yeah. and families and young people's use of digital media. Um, and look, we're really delighted to be talking to you about this today. And look, it might be a, a perspective that perhaps you're not expecting because we know a lot of younger people get the cyber safety talk a lot and um, the various ways that young people are using digital media um, in all sorts of beneficial ways. Um, for connection, for entertainment, for learning, for civic engagement, uh, for all sorts of things is often overshadowed by the discourses of risk that, um, that we hear about um, in the media. So we're going to be talking a little bit about that today and we want to think a little bit critically. We're not going to dismiss the risks because we know, we all know that there are some risks, but we're not going to regurgitate those to you today. What we're going to talk about is thinking critically about the discourses of young people um, and media, but also thinking about the way that adolescence has um, changed as a result of digital media technologies and, and network technologies, which means that so much of our lives is now actually sort of 
lived online. Parts of our lives are lived online. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it does change some of the dynamics. And so that's, that's what we're going to be talking about today. So we might have the next slide, thank you, and probably um, the, the next one after that, thanks. So he, who here uh, uses social media? Mm -hmm. um, do you value it? Do you like using it? Yep. Do you think your parents worry about your use of digital media? Hands up, hands up if, yeah. they, if you think your parents worry. Yeah. And look, what, what sort of things do you think they're worried about? Do you think it might be sort of some of these sorts of headlines which might be influencing their concerns? So... We've got a few fairly sensationalist headlines up here. Gaming is as, is addictive as heroin. Um, you know, online predators, sexting, cyberbullying, and so on. Look, we we do know that these are risks, um, but we kind of get these risks kind of rammed down our throats, and there are very real consequences to the um, the dominance of this kind of risk. And we'll talk about that in a moment, but. One thing that's worth foregrounding here is that these sorts of collective concerns about media are actually not new. There's quite a long history to them. So even though the rhetoric that we hear is, you know, um, digital media and, and mobile phones and social media, it's all brand new and it's brought about all these societal problems, the likes of which we haven't seen before. There's actually a sort of historical amnesia with that, though, because we have heard them before, but everyone's just kind of forgotten. So um, there's actually quite a long history to this. So when trains were invented, or the locomotive, people were worried that women's uteruses would fly out of their bodies because their bodies weren't designed to travel at those speeds. I mean, it's insane. <laughs> is, is that not bonkers? Um, when the sewing machine was when the sewing machine was introduced, people probably men, were worried about women moving their legs up and down um, and how this would affect their sexuality. Similarly, with the introduction of telephones, people were worried that women would use them to make contact with people, men, outside of the home in inappropriate ways. And you're probably noticing a bit of a theme here in that it's often young people or women who are singled out as being vulnerable and corruptible and in need of protection. Um, so comic books, cinema um, and books have also all been the subject of similar panics. Um, and back in the 80s, there was also um, some panic around television and exposure to violent content. A bit later, video games, um, this concern that exposure to violence makes people violent or it desensitizes um, people to violence and really there's no compelling evidence no. to actually suggest that that's so I'll, I'll just sort of bounce off that cat because I mean one of my favorite moral panics and we're going to talk about what that term means and and um, explore it for you but um, one of my favorite ones was in the 19th century there was a, a panic about women um, riding bicycles because it was said they would get bicycle face from travelling at some speed, right? This was a real thing. Now, and so coming back to Kat's point, a lot of um, moral panics, they revolve around groups who are said to be vulnerable. And not surprisingly, that's often women and particularly young women. And one of the things Kat and I do in our research is uh, what I've always tried to do too, is to um, hear from young people and give them a voice. So go and interview them, do focus groups with them, ask them what they think. And I did a big project um, called uh, Young People, Sex, Love and Media a few years back and interviewed a whole lot of 13 to 17 year old people about how they formed their identities online and what they enjoyed. And so coming back to Kat's point, a lot of what you read in the mainstream media and what probably influences some of your parents are these sort of panic stories and they don't catch the complexity of how we now live where we've got you know reality is merged with a kind of virtual reality next slide thanks so um Catherine do you want to just 
quickly talk us through then these ingredients of a moral panic, according to um, <laughs> sociologist Stanley Cohen, who was writing in the 70s. Yeah. So, so um, Stanley Cohen is really the original sort of theorist of moral panics, along with a guy called Stuart Hall. Um, and so he was writing at the time about um, moral panics, as in, you know, um, concerns expressed through the media and, and in public debate and through politicians. Um, that there, were, there was a sort of there were two subcultures, the mods and the rockers. And so, you know, it's like every era, there's a kind of musical genre and a, and a fashion that goes with it. Um, and there was this, you know, outcry about the, you know, that young people were going wild and society was going to hell in a handbasket. And so, you know, there's a very long history to panics about young people and what they're doing with popular culture. Um, and Cohen identifies several ingredients that are needed for a moral panic. Firstly, concern, that there is generally a widespread concern about an issue or group of people. So it could be young women using social media, for instance, that's an example of that. Um, Hostility, with this, um, so what Cohen's talking about there is that it's usually directed towards subcultures or uses of media practice, particularly in this day and age. Um, so use of technologies or platforms um, and a sort of hostility and concern about it. Um, and consensus, there is generally some kind of consensus that a problem exists and something needs to be urgently done about it. Um, and disproportionality is another feature that he identified. A moral panic does not mean there is no issue at all, right? But it's been blown out of proportion. It's been amplified through the media. So what will happen is, um, you know, there's a new technology, say, someone comes out and says, usually a psychologist or some well-meaning expert who hasn't actually talked to the people using the technology, um, you know, and I guess I'd say that Kat and I are interested not so much in what media is doing to young people. We're interested in what young people are doing with it. That's a different focus. But, you know, often paediatricians or psychologists will come out, express a concern. It will get amplified in the media. And then politicians feel they have to act, you know. And so that, that's a kind of classic way a moral panic grows. Um, yeah, and, and moral panics are often episodic. They are conjured up quickly, but then often dissipate, but then they recur. So, you, um, and, you know, I wrote a book in 2006 called Why TV is Good for Kids um, when, I, when my kids were young, because I got sick of being guilt tripped as a mother, as a working mother about, you know, if you let your kids watch TV, they're going to end up with all sorts of disorders. You know, I, I knew the research on this, it was absolute rubbish. So I wrote a book really aimed at parents saying, calm down, you know, your kids are going to be all right. And, um, you know, there's a kind of media literacy that we develop through watching television. You know, these days, free-to-air television is not something any young person looks at. It's TikTok or whatever. But the point being, the same sorts of concerns are expressed about it. And usually there's a moral element to moral panics, right? So this, the, the idea is someone's at risk, often women and children, and, um, you know, the moral police have to step in and save them. You know, it's a very conservative sort of narrative, really. Yeah. Next slide. Um, so here's, uh, <laughs> I love this example. Younger generations are growing horns in the back of their heads. Anyone here have horns or would like Just to admit feel. to them? I think they're meant to be sort of around here. <laughs> I mean, this is a, this is a ridiculous headline. Um, <laughs> Did you find anything? Um, <laughs> look, the, the, the kind of paper that was published here was um, basically bone spurs, potentially from poor posture. Um, and the authors in the paper had said, you know, had speculated that it may be as a result of using a phone, but there was no, there was no causation. This is where, um, you know, there may be a correlation between things, but then people will say this causes this. There is no, and that's often how some of these panics become amplified because then the media wants to reduce it to a, uh, a short and catchy headline that already plays into the existing concerns of the population. So that's what happened here. Debunked the absurd story about smartphones causing kids to sprout 
horns. Uh, and there's another example. Um, you may, is, is everyone? Oh, yes. No, I think everyone is familiar with this one. <laughs> So look, I would, given uh, given the amount of uh, kind of chatter that that has uh, provoked, I would kind of love to hear people's thoughts on this. Perhaps at the end, yeah. I assume everyone's familiar with this, the Momo challenge, which was said to uh, um, provoke young people to uh, commit violent acts or self harm there was actually never any evidence of this in fact the potential harm was probably done through the the media reporting of it um rather than th this actually being an issue so um you know these are these are pretty good examples um Kat, can yep. i just jump in there and just say look as a former as a former print and tv journalist um you know i'm very familiar with how these stories get generated and um and and the thing is, as a journalist, um, you know, it's, I, I don't know if ever, any of you have ever watched A Current Affair, but A Current Affair runs on this formula, which is, you know, um, every the, the story every concerned parent needs to watch tonight, you know, about someone, I don't know, kids spreading kitchen germs or, you know, <laughs> a shonky renovation, you know, next door or whatever it is. And... Um, so, so that, so the thing is that there's a kind of formula when you work in the media. I mean, hopefully, I did a bit more sophisticated stuff than this, but um, there, you know, we we used to joke about it. Oh, it's it's um, winter, so it must be killer flu season. It's um, Christmas, so there must be exploding Christmas toy toy story. You know, there's there are, there's a real formula that pushes these stories out. Um. Okay, so I think the next slide. Thank you. Okay, so look, we're not denying that there are risks. We we know that um, when we go online, a lot of people do have negative experiences. Whether or not those experiences neatly correlate with the panic issues is sort of another story. And I mean, that sort of gets us thinking about, look, what are the actual real, but probably you know, unintended consequences of focusing on these few high profile, highly publicised risks around online predators and, um, you know, um, cyberbullying and, and sexting and so on. Um, I'd, I'd love to, if anyone's sort of willing, does anyone have any thoughts on this that they would like to share? What does it mean when we're just responding to the panic? What gets lost? We're using the silence technique. You. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So if, for people who didn't hear that, um, sorry, what's your name? Persephone, great name. Uh, Persephone just said that um, one of the characteristics of what happens when a moral panic's in full flight is people respond emotionally. Um, they're not, um, you know, they're not really being rational actors and it becomes very hard to engage them in debate. Um, you know, and I'm, Kat and I have both done media debates, you know, TV and things like that, where, you, you know, someone on a panel will assert something and say something that, there's no evidence for it's. I mean, I remember being on a panel once talking about moral panics, and it was about um, young people and, and girls and sexuality. And um, this woman on the panel, who was a pretty conservative person, it must be said, said, Oh, they're selling pole dancing kits to babies. Now, I mean, what? <laughs> yeah, she just asserted this on, on national television, right? I mean, and I, I don't have the evidence that they're not, but it's very unlikely, it seems to me, right? So people tend to say very emotive things. Anyone else? Can I ask you a question? Oh, this one up there. Yeah. People are thinking, um, they're not thinking logically, so the evidence gets lost. So these headlines are basically written, so we're drawn to them. So we, um, we respond to this um, 
big new thing. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, look, there, I, I mean, I could talk about this stuff for hours. I'm not going to. But uh, why is there a disproportionate focus on risk? Look, the mobile phone is highly visible and it enables young people to have a certain agency and independence away from the parental gaze. That can make authority figures uneasy, okay, because they, they're worried about what their kids are doing, but also it's, it's kind of out of their control and there's no transparency around it. You know, the thing about these mobile devices is that what we're doing on them is not visible to others. That is part of the appeal for young people. It's not like the family television, which tended to be, you know, in a very public space and, um, you know, didn't enable the, the kind of interaction that does. So the, the mobile phone is something that's it's always there. It's something that parents don't always have control over or, or full um, kind of visibility of. And that can make, um, you know, people nervous. And, and we know that... Um, the, these technologies have become such an integral part of our lives. They are always there. So it is quite easy for them to become the locus of all of our concerns. So we know that, at, and I'm going to slide on this, and we'll talk about this in, the moment, in a moment, but we know that adolescence is actually a really, really difficult time when there is going to be in, um, increased conflicts between parents and children where young people are just looking for greater autonomy and independence. We now have the presence of the phone. It's easy to blame all of that on the phone forgetting that actually these issues have been around for a long time. And we'll talk about that in just a can minute. I, can I just jump in there too, Kat? Um, I, I, one of the things I wanted to say was that I think um, part of why there's this focus on risk, to me, a lot of the discourses of protection mask discourses of control. And I think that um, discourses of control and um, techniques of control are very overwhelmingly aimed at young women um, as they've been aimed at women historically. And I'll just say this very quickly, but one of the things I do in the course of my work is I work with producers on reality TV shows like Maths and Big Brothers, talking to them about um, what happens on those shows and how they have a duty of care to the contestants, right? And in the course of doing this, I did some research with teenage girls about 10 years ago uh, um, who were a predominant audience for Big Brother. And one of the interesting things to me is that in the media, there's this discourse that, you know, teenage girls, you know, that they consume junk television or junk media and, you know, they're, they're all hysterical and silly and, you know, someone needs to kind of look after them um, and educate them. And when I actually spoke to teenage girls about what they loved about Big Brother, I'll never forget one of them saying, you know why I love the Big Brother house? Because it's like my life. And I said, it's like your life. What do you mean? And she said, well, I'm under complete surveillance from my parents, from teachers. Um, and at high school, I've got to work out how to stand out and fit in simultaneously. And I said, that's really interesting. She said, yeah, you know, like all my peers sort of, we're all watching each other. And then there were boys at the bus stop. And, you know, she said, I can really relate to the big brother house. I feel like I'm in it. So when you actually ask people what interests them, it's very different to what is said about them. So um, as I just mentioned, we know that a, a, adolescence is a, it's been referred to as a time of storm and stress. It is a, a period, a, a life stage, which has been thoroughly studied by academics from a number of um, disciplines. Um, and one uh, scholar, um, Stanley Hall, referred to it as a time of storm and stress. So there are many experiences which are common um, uh, to a lot of adolescents in this time, things like the importance of friendships, but also the, the presence of um, peer drama, um, peer conflict, exclusion, but again, also that desire for autonomy and independence away from the parental gaze, um, and also a desire to take risks. So it's a really interesting um, time. It sort of it, it tends to elicit a bit of anxiety on the part of parents and other authority uh, figures. 
because it is in that sort of liminal, marginal space between childhood and adulthood where young people are trying to navigate those boundaries between uh, sort of exercising and enacting independence, but also at the same time needing some guidance and support. So when we think about the risk discourses in relation to social media, and the way that they have, uh, in many cases, sort of elicited these protective responses, that does not always sit easily with young people who are resisting them because they want that, that autonomy. So it is, it is tricky for parents and for teachers and for authority figures to try and balance that desire for autonomy, but also help young people. So this is where social media does actually change some of the, the dynamics of adolescence. So, you know, when I was, when I was an adolescent where she didn't have social media um, and we didn't have, I didn't have a mobile phone until I was 19. Um, I didn't have my first social media account until I was 27. So it was really, because that's when they came out. <laughs> so really what it is, it is quite different. Um, the ways in which young people are living out these um, parts of their lives through these public spaces um, and some of those uh, stress points of adolescence do also play out online um, and they sort of do change some of these dynamics so um, we might go to the next slide thanks so um, I want to just draw on the work of Dana Boyd here and I understand that Hopefully some of you have read um, the introductory text um, from her book, It's Complicated. Um, but she points out four what we call affordances of um, networked media. Um, it, she's really talking about the features. What do these platforms allow? These affordances of social media uh, do change the dynamics of some of those um, typical adolescent experiences in ways that we actually do need to be mindful of. Um, Catherine, did you want to go through um, those? Sure. Yeah. So um, it, I really recommend reading Dana Boyd if you're interested in social media. She's really one of the best writers on the subject and she's quite accessible. Um, so she identifies some distinct features of social media platforms. Persistence, the durability of online expressions and content. So this is something that no doubt at some points you've, you've had a, a, a sort of warning lecture on. We, you know, what do you, you know, the digital footprint will be there for life. Uh, I'm sure that someone at some points talked to you about that. Um, I mean, I, the example I give here is um, the last couple of years of my life, I was at a boarding school and um, on weekends when we were very bored, um, we dress up in each other's lingerie and take photographs of each other with lots of makeup on. I've got Polaroids in my photo album, right? I mean, these days we'd be making TikTok videos, okay? So this stuff is there forever, potentially. Visibility, the potential audience who can bear witness. As you know, you can't necessarily always control who's going to react or respond. Um, spreadability, the ease with which content can be shared. And so you're all media producers. You know, back in the day when I was a journalist, there were professional journalists and entertainers and everyone else just kind of was the audience. But it's not like that anymore. You're all producers of content. And searchability, the ability to find content. Um, so, you know, they, they, these, are, these are all features of what it means to live your life online. And I guess I'd add to that, um, the blurring of the boundary between the public and the private. So one of the things social media has enabled is sharing all sorts of things about ourselves. And what that does is it, is it stretches the boundaries of um, the public, or it, it stretches the boundaries between the public and private. And it also alters our idea of what should be private. And, and some of those issues that we experience as adolescents like peer drama and peer conflict um, that have been around forever mm. and since when I was at school have now shifted because of those affordances of social media. So when I was at school, you know, I might come to school one day and go to talk to my friends and then find out that no one's talking to me. Mm. I'd go to talk to them, they would just literally turn their back on me, right? And I didn't know what I had done 
and no one would bother to tell me, right? So, so you're put in the freezer for something and you just have to go and find another friendship group or, or just kind of sit it out until that group of people decides that they're going to talk to you again. Um, you know, today this often happens, but it will happen on social media. So you might find out that you've been put in the freezer because um, you were part of a chat online and then you go to post a comment and then you realise that you've been left out of it. They've removed you, right, and you don't know why. Or um, you go onto Instagram and you see that all of your friends, your closest friends, are around at someone's house and you haven't been invited. And you can be sitting at home in your bed on the weekend and that can be incredibly hurtful, you know. So in my time, you, you know, you have to go to school and, and find out about it. So there's, a, there's a, a sort of a greater immediacy, I suppose. It's still really, really um, hurtful. Um, so the, the way we can see, and, and look, this is where we see this sort of, I'm sure you've all been told about cyberbullying. But when I've talked to parents and young people, a much more prevalent issue seems to be not this overt or harmful bullying, but it's the drama or the bitchiness or the exclusion which now plays out online and which is really, really hurtful for young people. Now, there can be a tendency to blame social media for that. You know, social media is, is causing bullying, whatever. It's not. Bullying and this kind of drama has been around for a long time, but now plays out online. It changes the dynamics of it in certain ways. And we, and we do need to be aware of how these things do play out online and what it might mean for other people. Um, and this is where, um, you know, this issue of digital citizenship comes in. Um, so I think we've got the next slide here. So... Um, this notion of digital citizenship has um, sort of been coined to think about what it means to be a good uh, citizen online. You know, it's like how do we address these more nuanced, you know, um, issues around, you know, exclusion or um, sort of on-demand friendship, which can be quite difficult as well. We know that social media enables this constant connection um, where you might have friends at, you know, 10 o'clock at night. Are you expected to respond? You know, so this kind of on-demand, on-call friendship as well. So we see the way that, that social media has changed all of these dynamics and that we need to Think about what this means, not in terms of the, those big overarching risks, which, yes, we do need to be aware of, but I'm sure you all have strategies for managing those. But it's these other issues that, that people seem to be grappling with. You know, what's the answer? How do we help young people navigate some of the negative elements of, um, of online um, media? Now, the whole protectionism, as we've just you know, thoroughly kind of argued, I think, is not the answer. It's not about saying just put the device away. Um, that's not a reasonable request. It's not about saying, well, just, just stop it or put it away or, or don't do this. Or it's not about um, taking devices away or restricting. We know that that's not going to help. So instead, we need to think through some of these issues in terms of digital citizenship. So what is digital citizenship? It's the norms of behaviour with regard to technology use or a concept that includes a range of theoretical conceptions from those that emphasise the technological aspect, while others investigate the affordances of digital media to suggest new forms of citizenship. So what does that mean? It means that we have certain rights and obligations online. Um, the online world isn't just, you know, even though it might feel like this sort of anarchic kind of free-for-all space, um, we need to think about the sorts of rights and obligations we have offline and how these also apply online. So that, that includes a, um, a right to privacy and a right to respect online. The online world is not some other sort of inauthentic space. You might hear um, 
your parents or, or teachers or other authority figures talk about the real world and the online world as if they are these two distinct <laughs> worlds that never meet we know that that's not the case they've learned the online world is also the real world for people so those same rules around ethics respect consent um, also play out in online spaces Catherine do you want to add yeah anything? no I mean I think this idea of digital citizenship as Kat's unpacking it is really um about the and I've, I've sort of argued this myself in um research reports I've written for um, organisations like Google, looking at media content and looking at what, these days, how do we regulate media content? Now, obviously, in on the internet, it is a, it can be a kind of wild west. I mean, you can kind of find anything on the internet, as you know. Um, so the question is, how do you regulate it? Well, traditionally, media content was regulated by the government, right? So the government would classify material and say, um, you know, this is refused classification, it's banned, you know, this is X-rated, this is R-rated, et cetera. Um, you know, that system, while it's still in operation, is, you know, absolutely redundant when it comes to the internet. Um, so you, you say, who are the other stakeholders in the internet in, on platforms and technologies? Well, obviously, industry, companies, they bear some responsibility, you know, whether whatever the platform is, um, Arguably, they have a responsibility to give users tools to report inappropriate content. Because, mm -hmm. you know, you don't, I mean, if someone posts, posts porn on Facebook, uh, it doesn't belong there. And, you know, it should be able to be flagged and taken down quickly because it's not the purpose of Facebook. Um, but then the third stakeholder group, I would argue, is, are the digital citizens, all of us media users and consumers who are also media producers. So that's really, for me, what the pointy end of digital citizenship is, asking ourselves what we owe each other in the virtual world and, and, and having agency about responding when you see something in the same way you do it in the playground, which is wrong, hopefully, and you're prepared to be an ethical bystander and step up and say, hey, stop it. I think that that's just about um, it from us. I think we, it'd be great to hear from you all about what being a good digital citizen means to you um, and some of the considerations that, that you take into account when you're um, socialising or, or interacting online. You know, is it thinking about... Um, Things that people have done to you online or negative experiences that you've had online and trying to make sure that you're not reproducing um, those sorts of experiences for others. Um, thinking about consent. I mean, like when I was in high school, you could go to a party on the weekend and uh, well, maybe not in high school, maybe I say college, I'll say university. And, <laughs> and you know, you'd, you'd drink and then you could be throwing up on someone's balcony and someone might take a photo of that okay but at the time it wouldn't go onto social media right someone could take a photo of me doing something really embarrassing at a party but you know I could sure it's visible but only to the people that have the photo um, and I could chuck it in the bin we know that that kind of persistence and the durability and the searchability of um, online media these days changes those dynamics and it therefore needs to change the way that we think about what we're doing with not only our own information but also probably more importantly information photos about our friends and so on so I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it there and would love to hear from you guys Or perhaps we can just go to questions if, if you prefer. Yes, please. Oh. <laughs> 
Um, to answer your question before how you were saying like what can we do on social media and that, I just think like honestly like I've I haven't done this but you know something I learned is just like mind your business on social media like if you see something that is a bit like messed up and you don't think it should be there, like if it's something like pornography or something, it's honestly best just to like leave it and not even try to do anything about it. And because like, for example, if it's on like Instagram, it, Instagram's going to take it down. So I think it's best to just kind of like stay back, mind your business, unless it's like something serious, but like, it's better just to not get involved into anything. Cause like, you know, I don't know, I get dragged into a lot of stuff. So it's best to just kind of like mind your business. Um, so you have no reason to be like dragged into stuff. And that. So. Thank yeah. you. I mean, oh, widespread agreement. I, yeah, you raise an interesting issue, I suppose, about, um, yeah, being dragged. Are you sort of referring to being dragged into drama? Mm. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. And look, if everyone did the same thing and was just like, I'm not engaging with this drama, then presumably that would de-escalate the situation. Mm. Mm -hmm. but okay can i can i put a question as a follow-on from this um is um you know what about if you're in a group in a chat you know in a chat room or whatever it is and you're um you're you're seeing someone being bullied okay i mean would you step in for, is that worth stepping into or would you, are you saying you just don't want to get involved can we just use the mic? Sorry, just for everyone can hear online as well. Thank you. Um, I just think that it's like, if you're on a group chat with someone and like someone else is getting bullied, I don't know, first of all, why would you be on that? Like, I don't know, like, I just like, what, what, why are you going to be on a group chat and just have people bullying each other? But anyways, um, if I see someone getting bullied, like my take, I tend to like use humor as a way to like mm -hmm. deal with stuff. Oh. No, I'm saying... So, like, obviously, I'm not going to bully them back, but, like, I might make a comment being, like, like, stop being so, like, aggressive or something like that to the person who's, like, bullying someone. Of course, I don't want to get fully involved because it's just, like, I don't want to, like, start, like, make, stir up the pot and make it more of a big deal. But I think that, in my opinion, I'd probably just, like, make a comment being, like, you know, like, why are you being so intense or something like that? But it's honestly best to just, like, mind your business because if you get involved then it's just like it might like fuel the person who's like bullying i think there's a question down here thank you hang on just, just wait, wait for the, the mic. microphone down here thanks just along in the middle oh, thank you. um i think also adding on to her point maybe not leaving it in the way of just like completely ignoring it but I also think on social media sharing stuff is also a really dangerous problem like if you see something inappropriate it can go viral really instantly with mm. everyone sending it to people sending it to group chats and I think that's also linking to a point about just leaving it there if you see something that'll embarrass someone or make their life even worse I feel like either just taking it down or just not interacting with it is like this easiest and safest way to go and that's something that can go wrong with social media yeah I think I mean it sounds and from what I've heard as well it this is an issue the kind of drama and the way that it can play out in very um public ways and it is a tricky issue because it doesn't neatly fall under that category of cyberbullying always sometimes it's just um you know a, a little bit more um covert it is tricky it's like how do you what kind of judgments do you make about how you act in that kind of situation? You know, is my involvement going to make this worse? Um, or will, you know, it, it is, it's a tricky judgment call. I think it's thinking about the ethics, thinking about if I was the one here, how would I feel? If this was being done to me, what would I want? You know, because sometimes it can be 
hugely um, sort of comforting when you know you've got someone on your side or calling like calling out truly bad behavior. So I think I just say, you know, try and use your judgment, put yourself in, in those shoes and think about what, what would I want or, you know, how would I want to be treated in this situation? Um, there's another question just here. Or comment or comment. And then there's another question up the back after this online one. So we've just actually got two online questions. The first one is how should people act ethically on social media? And the second one is how could media companies and government help enforce more positive behaviours? I'll take the ethics one. So oh, you leave the hard one for me. <laughs> that second one's really hard. No, you go for it. Um, so I think, look, when we talk about ethics, and we know this in you know, our daily lives, that we make ethical decisions all the time, right? And one of those decisions might be um, being an ethical bystander. Are you going to just, you know, walk past some bad behaviour or are you going to support someone who's being bullied or whatever? That's an ethical choice you make, right? So I think it really, um, you know, it, I, I think there are ethics of online and social media behaviour that are the same as the sorts of decisions we make all the time in real life and so-called real life. And ethics are not black and white. It's not like the 10 commandments, you know, you can't write them all down in stone. They are contingent is a word I'd use. They, it depends. There are no black and white right answers always. So what we do all the time without even thinking about it is, is ethics are really what kind of person do we wanna be? You know, we're making those choices all the time and it absolutely applies online. Mm. What was the second question? Something about platforms? Media companies and government have to enforce more positive. That's the million dollar question really, isn't it? Mm. Um, platforms themselves, I mean, this, this, there's a much bigger question about regulating platforms. How do you regulate platforms? They mm. often say they're not responsible for the sort of content that they're hosting. Um, you know, we know, we know the government, there is a, there is a very robust um, and comprehensive uh, online safety and regulatory framework in Australia. We have the Office of the eSafety Commissioner. Um, they have lots of useful resources and so on. Their approach is still um, tends to kind of be more on the side of protectionism, um, but there are you know, they can take action in relation to serious incidents of, of cyberbullying and so on. Um, I, I think that, I mean, it's such a, it's, it's a, there are so many issues um, that we need to think about um, in engaging online and there's not one easy answer. No, and one of the things I'll just add, Kat, is that, um, um, and there is a, a new book out called Regulating Platforms by Terry Flew, F-L-E-W, who's a professor at Sydney Uni. So if you're interested in regulation, it's a very accessible book. Um, but one of the things that we know is when the internet first arrived in really in a mainstream way in the early 2000s, um, it was a kind of common thing for people like us who researched it to say, well, you can't regulate the internet. Now that is changing quite rapidly in the European Union, in Australia, even in the US. Um, so that old idea that um, Facebook or whomever is not really responsible for the comments of third parties, um, there've been a lot of recent court cases about defamation and involving Facebook. So watch this space. I think we're gonna see a lot more appetite for regulating online and social media. Okay, we've got a question up there. And then down here. Do you think that from the current trends, the use and dependence on social media will continue to increase? Um, I think, look, I think we've seen a, a bit of a shift since COVID. Um, obviously, we, we've come to rely on, you know, when to rely on networked technologies to get us through the pandemic for everything, for schooling, 
for work, for social connection, for talking to extended family. Okay, so um, I think certainly our dependence on network technologies was really brought into sharp focus as a result of the pandemic. And um, I think there has been some permanent shifts as a result of that. We see more people working remotely um, and so on. Whether or not it sort of increases from this level, I'm, I'm not sure, possibly. I mean, there's no doubt that these technologies have become such an integral part of our lives and make our lives easier and better in so many different ways. But of course, there are some downsides to that that we do need to manage. Um, you know, it has increased our, our screen time. Um, I know I need to try and be a bit more um, disciplined putting, putting my device down. Catherine, what do you think? Well, I, all I can say is if I can't find my phone, I panic. <laughs> now, you know, once upon a time, I always knew where the phone was. It was, it was on, on that whole table. So, I mean, there's, there, I think we do have a, there's no question we have a dependence, but I'd be very wary about using words like addiction. You know, that's really, it, it's an unnuanced way of thinking about um, how these technologies and platforms integrate with our lives. There's a question down here. Um, so how would you say to combat like the risks associated with social media? Is it more like solving societal issues or like restricting features on social media platforms and adding more safety protocols? Um, yeah, look, again, this sort of multifaceted approach um, to addressing risk. I just want to say at this point that we should um, distinguish between risk and harm. We encounter mm. risk every single day, okay? I, in, I took risks. I, I feel like I sort of take risks just walking anywhere in Sydney with the way people drive. Like, it just stresses me out. Um, so we encounter risks everywhere, okay? Risk is part of our lives. Um, harm is something different, okay? So... Um, we should, there definitely should be um, strategies um, and uh, ways in which potential harms are reduced. Certainly platforms and the makers of technologies do need to think more actively about embedding um, more sort of uh, safety design features into their technologies. And there is certainly... Um, pressure being put on companies in Australia towards this safety by design principle. Of course, it's also about, um, you know, literacy, digital media literacy, making sure that people and not just young people, but everyone um, is aware of uh, some of the negative elements of going online and that's not and I'm, again I'm not just talking about young people I know that young people are often singled out but adults I mean we know that misinformation is a problem that conspiracy theories circulate on social media and, and you know all sorts of people believe them so um, yeah I think there needs to be sort of multiple approaches both at the um, government level um, at the level of, of platforms and technology companies and also at the individual level as well making sure that people are uh, educated and equipped with the knowledge and the critical thinking skills and the practical skills to actually reduce potential harms. Okay. Um, we have time for one more question. If anyone's, I think there's a young lady there. Okay. Um, I think that, um, nowadays, young people are like forming their identity through the media that they're exposed to online. Um, and that tends to be like the same thing for everyone because we're all experiencing like the trends. Um, do you think that's like fake and inauthentic to like be forming our identity through that? Um, can I just, just chime in there and say um, that young people, when they're forming an identity, do it in relation to media and external sources anyway. So whether that, you know, like I had, I had posters of Madonna on my wall, you know, so it was pop music at the time. It was the shows I was watching on free-to-air television. There are a whole bunch of those external sources that helped me form and express 
my identity. Those, those aren't fake. And so, yes, you're right, young people are um, forming their identity in part from the kind of information that they're coming across online and the sorts of images online in a similar way. I don't think that's inauthentic. I think we need to be aware, though, of algorithms um, and that we will receive information um, that is tailored specifically for us, which may limit our worldview, um, which means that you might, your whole feed might be um, Kardashians or pop culture, and that might be fine, or it might be fairly limiting um, in the sort of uh, thing that you are exposed to. I think it can be a problem when you have, um, you know, right. online groups with fairly extreme um, views or kind of radical views. We can see that that happens sometimes with some young people being a bit disenfranchised and getting, you know, getting in those little kind of echo chambers and little filter bubbles. So again, I think just being aware of that, that these, some of these spaces are tailored just for you and it may be limiting what you're being exposed to. Yeah. Thanks, Kat. I think we're going to oh. wrap up. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, thanks for the question. Thank you so much. All right. So I just wanted to say thank you to Catherine and Catherine for your insightful presentation. I hope everyone here and also online enjoyed it.